One of my favorite places for a family vacation is just off the coast of Florida. You can almost taste the air as it blows across the salty ocean waters. I could spend hours sitting on the sand in the shade listening to the rhythmic sound of the waves crashing in. For me, there is healing in every single part of the experience. From the cleansing saltwater air to the soothing sounds of the seagulls and the refreshing rays of the sun. Something about the water brings a feeling of peace, no matter how tightly wound I become from the stress of life. I used to laugh at these televangelists and healers who held big meetings along Florida's coast. I knew what they were up to. I often thought, our prophet would never do that. But I was surprised as I started examining William Branham's early rise to fame and even more surprised as I started examining the names of those who joined Branham's Revival Trail and the locations that they chose in sermons that we no longer had access to hear. There were many men who joined William Branham in his early campaigns. They sat on the stage with him as the group toured. They were religious entertainers on stage, like a carnival moving from town to town. Each one of them had a history just as interesting and quote-unquote supernatural as William Branham's own life story. Yet they made big money selling their own special version of religious entertainment. Some of them cross-promoted, and William Branham bragged of their supernatural powers in his publications. Yet most of them never joined the message. I wondered why. On July 6, 1947, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch published their investigative report on William Branham's healing revival. Reporters who were increasingly skeptical over the lack of miracles in Branham's meetings focused their attention to the faith healings. Suddenly, just days after their investigative report, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch changed their attention to a new prophet of healing, Havok Hagopian, whose worldwide healing fame drew crowds of thousands, had just landed in Palm Springs, California. He came to the United States after holding massive healing meetings in Iran, Cairo, New York, and Los Angeles, California. Avok Kagopian was brought to America by a millionaire named Cricker Achelian to heal his son. But as thousands of people poured into Palm Springs seeking their own healing, the scene turned into complete chaos. For months on end, Avok prayed for Achelian's paralyzed son, while a multitude of people gathered in Palm Springs for their chance with the healer. Avok stayed in the luxurious home of the Archelian family, treating only 30 people per day. The situation grew so dire that the police force had to call in reserves to bring order back to the city. Bars started selling food, peddlers opened food stands, and still there was not enough food for the multitude of people. Yet as Avok healed the multitude, and many claimed healing, Archelian's son remained crippled. Avok doubled his appointments, healing 60 people per day. Then after a few weeks, he took a vacation in the mountains. Hundreds of people camped outside the Archelian home during Avok's mountain retreat. Demand for Avok was so great in the United States that the U.S. government got involved. Representative George Smathers introduced new laws intended to extend Avok's visa. Yet, even with all the healing frenzy, Archelian's son remained crippled. Tom Kardashian, Kim Kardashian's great-grandfather, sponsored Avok's tour through the United States and Canada. Tom pledged to build a temple in Los Angeles for Avok. I was a little surprised when I found that William Branham admitted that the same people sponsoring Avok Hagopian had sent up in Indiana to sponsor his own healing tour. I was even more surprised when I found photographs of the Prophet touring with Avok Hagopian. The Prophet was wearing an expensive suit and had slick back hair, a far cry from the Kentucky hillbilly persona that he would later incorporate into his ministry. Sadly, 
Archelian's son was never cured by either Avok or William Branham. The family eventually moved to a secluded area where Avok could rest and the boy's condition was never again reported. William Branham continued to tour the United States and Canada, starting the year in Miami, Florida with Little David. The Branham-Walker meetings were timed perfectly with Avok's healing tour, and together they took photographs for an article no longer available to people in the message. After Miami, the Walker-Branham tour made its way to Tampa, Florida. Just as they did during their meetings in Indianapolis at the Cato Tabernacle, in St. Louis and in Miami, the dynamic healing duo packed the auditorium. But as young David Walker was entering into his divine healing career, William Branham was at the height of his own career and was already in high demand. The tour continued through Pensacola, Florida, and William Branham's campaign team advertised William Branham as America's Voice of Healing. Just days later, that title became the name of the Prophet's newsletter. The Voice of Healing publication was originally created to promote the William Branham campaigns. William Branham was the publisher, and it was printed from Shreveport, Louisiana. But the first issues of the publication did not mention Avoc or Little David anywhere in the articles contained within. Apparently, the first issue was created as an attempt to recognize and rebrand the Branham campaigns and its newsletter. The first issue contained legal verbiage intended to cease all previous committees and publications. I wondered, where are the copies of the previous publications? And why were Little David Walker and Ava Hagopian not included in this publication? It read, After much prayer, William Branham has decided to form a committee which should direct the policy of the Branham Healing Campaigns and the publication of The Voice of Healing. This will supersede all previous arrangements. This committee, besides Reverend Branham, includes Reverend Jack Moore and Reverend Gordon Lindsay. All correspondence concerning campaigns should be directed to Branham Healing Campaigns, Box 4097, Shreveport, Louisiana. After the Pensacola meetings, Reverend F.F. F. Bosworth joined Branham's revival tours. Bosworth, already well known for his own faith healing career, brought yet another attraction to the meetings. From Florida, the group headed to Kansas City, Kansas, where they filled the Memorial Hall. Then they moved on to the small town of Sedalia, Missouri, where they packed the convention hall at Liberty Park. The newspapers made it sound as if a convoy of ambulances followed the group as they went from town to town. Ern Baxter, who attended the revivals in Canada, joined the campaign. From there, the tour went through Oregon, landing at Eugene from May 18th to 23rd. Then, after Eugene, William Branham took a break from the revival tours. The fourth issue of Voice of Healing contained an article that described William Branham's early part of his healing ministry. I was still surprised that he even had a healing ministry before April 1947. It read, Reverend William Branham has returned to his home to rest for a period of time. So great has been his burden for the sick and the suffering that it is a difficult time for him to withdraw from the multitudes when there are so many needing his ministry. In the early part of his healing ministry, our brother would pray for the sick until one or two in the morning or until he would drop from sheer exhaustion. This version of the message I was raised to believe included an angel coming the very day that Israel became a nation. Reading this issue of The Voice of Healing and learning that the modern state of Israel was born May 14, 1948, it was difficult to trust anything that I had been told. Articles in the early issues of The Voice of Healing had even more confirmations that Branham's ministry started long before the stage persona we knew described and more confirmation that that history had been purposefully erased. During his rest at home in July, the Jeffersonville Evening News tried to contact William Branham to verify some of the claims that he had made during the healing revivals in Canada. William Branham had claimed to raise a man from the dead from the Undertaker's parlor in Jeffersonville, Indiana. 
the local newspapers in the small town, immediately familiar with the local events, knew that this was not true. According to the Jeffersonville Evening News, William Branham was absent, and a substitute minister was conducting services. The media frenzy continued, especially when William Branham stopped touring. A rumor quickly spread that Branham had died, and reporters from all over the country were contacting the Jeffersonville news media for information concerning his death. The local news media was well informed about the prophet's schedule, not only by the campaign advertisements, but also from the numerous people contacting reporters as Branham went from city to city, claiming to heal the sick and raise the dead. There was very little that the reporters could do to stop the momentum of the Branham campaigns. The revival was quickly growing. I was surprised as I noticed the ministers joining in the revival tours. Some of them were familiar faces whose ministries were launched by the Branham campaigns, yet previously I had no idea how closely they were connected in the prophet's early ministry. It was news to me how much they promoted each other to establish their careers. Some of them were on the editorial staff of his newsletter, The Voice of Healing. There were so many pieces to the puzzle coming together that it was almost unbelievable. The most surprising part of my research was learning that the Kardashian family were connected to William Branham's early ministry and learning that close relatives of the Kardashian patriarchs continued to work with and promote William Branham's revival campaigns and ministry for decades. I wanted to know more about this family, the family history, and why they would suddenly decide to take interest in a Jeffersonville, Indiana preacher who claimed to be an uneducated Kentucky hillbilly.